Uh, thank you for joining us today. Today we have a very special guest, as they all are. But today we have Pat Kramer with us. Um, and so to introduce Pat, you know, everyone has a story to tell. And for that reason, Pat created the Lifelong Stories Memoir Writing Service to capture valuable memories that our elders or ourselves, I guess, hold dear that we don't want to lose. Uh, so Pat Kramer is a professional news journalist, business writer with over 30 years of experience writing for major medias. Throughout her career, she's uh, been a news journalist, business copywriter. She's had over 500 articles published, which is amazing. Good for you, Pat. Um, but as a way to giving back, Pat provides workshops for seniors. Hello, on the benefits of writing memoirs. And she also speaks to youth in high schools across Los Angeles, where she lives with her dogs. Um, and also how it, what it's like to have a career as a writer. Um, and so she has dozens of workshops and seminars for seniors, youth, business associations, and other organizations. And over the past 10 years, Pat's written a number of family memoirs for individuals to document their personal histories. And having a, a memoir written is a valuable process, helps seniors connect with their past and also with people what they love. And what Pat and I have talked about is the seniors will start talking and telling their stories, which we've all heard over and over again. And then everyone stops listening. And so that's what we're gonna talk about today is how you can write your story, how she can help you write your story and tips of the trade. And I think she's gonna give us some examples. So Pat, take it away with your presentation. Thank you very much, Maggie. It's a pleasure to be here. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I am coming to you from the north part of Los Angeles in a little town called Sunland, California. And I'm gonna tell you more about my presentation right now. And uh, I'm gonna introduce you first to my grandfather who, oops, 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 oops. Let's see if we can go back to the beginning here. Somehow or another, we got off track. That happens. Ah, okay. So starting over again, here's my grandfather and I am going to tell you a little bit more about him. Matt or like, Pat, you have to share your screen because hmm. we actually can't see it yet. Okay. It's that trick. Somehow or another, I had it set up and it went away. Uh, I am so sorry about that. Technical Zoom. We there are we go. going to begin again. There we go. So let's talk about memoir writings. This was my grandfather sitting in his high back chair. I want to say this is about 1918 when this picture was taken. And I just love it. It's um, it's so he's so regal in that picture. So um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about why I do this. And, you know, as I say here, most of us don't know how much time we have left to share our stories. And the truth of the matter is we'd all like to think we're in control of the time that we have. But as you know, that isn't always so, particularly with the COVID epidemic the last two years, which by the way, I did lose a family member. Um, do you have children or grandchildren? How will they remember you after you have passed? You want to think about that now because now is when you can do something about it. So will they remember you by the stories that you told them? Or will, will they remember you by the stories that others tell them about you? Do you want to leave that up to chance? Who knows how people are going to tell your stories? They may tell it from their own point of view. And what will be your legacy that other people will remember you for? So, um, you know, my experience is that many of our elders, you know, pass away without having had anybody record their stories. And, you know, it's always the people come to me always with that sense of dismay. I hear this all the time saying, I wish I had talked to my grandmother. I wish I had talked to my grandfather or my dad or my mother. I wish I had asked them those story about those stories and the details about their early life because now it's too late and I'm never going to be able to find out. So as I say here, too often the stories that should be told and the ones that have the most meaning, and I'll say also value, 
never make it onto paper. And why is that? So it's because we're all busy people. Um, the younger generation is working, is busy, feels they already know what they need to know, maybe isn't interested right now in knowing all those stories. I guarantee you later, it might be 15, 20 years from now, they will look back as they get older and say, I wish I had asked my grandparents or my parents to write those things down. So um, I'm part of the baby boomer generation. I think many of us are, and we're now aging into our own retirement. And so we have the technology now to do something about recording those stories. And that's why I think more people are doing their memoirs um, with the onset of uh, Ancestry.com. Uh, you know, I myself got involved in writing my family's memoir. But first I had to do the research because I didn't have that much information because I too had not asked for those stories. So I had to go digging and find out the details that I didn't have. So a lot of people say to me when I do presentations like I'm giving you right now, you know, is it self-indulgent to spend the time or money on, you know, this type of a project for myself? Is it, is it something that people will really appreciate? And some of the objections I hear are, I don't have the time, I'm busy. If you think about it, what are you busy with? Uh, I don't want my kids paying for this. I hear that a lot, they can't afford it. The kids are often the ones that tell me they want this done for their parents. And yes, they are willing to pay for it because they are the ones who are gonna be robbed of those memories if it isn't written down. Uh, they're not gonna have those stories to pass on to their own children. Uh, I don't think my life is that interesting. It probably is more interesting than you think to someone else. Um, I am a journalist by trade. I worked in radio. I was a news broadcaster. And I also worked in print as a print journalist. There's a lot of questions that I ask when I interview people to write their memoirs. And I often find out details about them that are extremely interesting that they had not thought were interesting or they just hadn't thought about. Um, oftentimes, seniors tell me they don't know how to do their own memoir. They don't have any idea where to begin. They're overwhelmed. There's too much information. They don't know what's important. Uh, they'd like to do it, but it's too hard. Once they start, they just can't maintain the momentum. And also it's hard for them to hold a pen for long periods of time. Um, maybe they're worried no one is going to read it. And you know what? You're never gonna know if you never write it. And also a lot of people say they'd like to write it, but they just, they don't have the ability to do it. And often they'll say they're, they're busy, but they're really not all that busy. They're doing things to fill their time. But this is actually an important project. And it's really important because I'm going to tell you all the benefits that come in a moment, but it's going to bring you back to the memories that you really cherish. And those are good memories. So it's important to review them. So what is a memoir? A memoir is defined as a historical account or biography written from personal knowledge or from special sources, if you're not the subject, writing it, uh, as in, in 1924, she published a short memoir of her husband's life. A memoir is also compared to a historical account, a record, a history, a narrative, a life story, or a portrait of the author. And while an autobiography will tell the story from your perspective, and it does so in chronological order. Um, a memoir, a singular memoir, is usually about a, a portion of your life that you want to focus on. So your memoir could be about coming of age from childhood to 
you know, your career. Um, and you're focusing mostly on that part of your life. Um, whereas your memoirs might be a whole book. So that's the difference. Now you heard of the objection, so I'm gonna tell you about the benefits and this is really cool. Um, you get to relive all your favorite memories and you get to re-experience them. And this could be about people that you've loved who have passed on, people who are mentors to you, your grandparents, your friends in life, could be about a child that you lost that you would like to talk about. Uh, and you would like to make sure other people remember your child because oftentimes the people who have passed are not spoken about in families and it's important to speak about them. Um, telling your story factually sets the audience straight on what your perspective is of how you lived your life as opposed to someone else telling your story from their perspective, and maybe they put a little different slant on it. Um, sharing values that you would like people to remember, uh, your children, your grandchildren, um, you would like to instill in them these very important values. This is how you can do it. It's a way to acknowledge the hardships you've had, but also to see how those hardships made you stronger. And oftentimes I find when I'm talking to my elders that I'm interviewing about their memoir, um, they'll tell me a story about hardship in early life, but they tell it from an adult point of view, which is different from, from a child's point of view. And they may have held on to the memory that they had as a child, but when they get to retell the story now, they see it in a different way. And that's beneficial emotionally for them. It helps them go through that experience without the trauma. Um, it's a way to look past the difficulties you've had in life, create a record or a legacy of your life for the people that are going to follow you. It's a way to share time with another person who's listening and cares about your stories. And that's really important because oftentimes Maybe the stories you want to tell, no one's got time to hear. And it's also a way to provide a tangible record that your family members can hold on to after you're gone and pass down to future generations. So what do most people write about? Um, I always ask people to begin with where you were born, what it was like in the town or the country where you were living uh, from your earliest memories. Talk about your grandparents, talk about your parents, your siblings, um, the people who had an influence on you in your early life. Talk about the difficulties, the conflicts. Um, what did you like about the people who were around you in early life? What did you not like about them? Talk about what conditions were like. Oftentimes, the people that I'm speaking with lived through a war and that's, you know, played a significant role in their life afterward. And I'm going to tell you more about that very shortly. Uh, who were your friends? What were your teachers like? What subjects did you excel in in school? Um, what were your hobbies? Who were your pets? Did you have pets? Uh, what were you like as a child? Was there anything that happened in your early childhood that was traumatic? Maybe you lost a parent or a sibling. How did that affect you and the rest of your family? Um, what did you wanna be when you were young? Who, who did you wanna be when you grew up? And did that come to fruition? Um, who were your role models? And if you could have changed anything about your life, what would you have changed? So that's what I usually, go over with people. We don't necessarily do that all in one uh, interview. We might break it into separate one hour long interviews um, because it's a lot to absorb. So I'm gonna give you some examples. I'm gonna start with Marta. Marta is someone who I interviewed for a memoir at the beginning of this year and Marta's children hired me 
This is Marta and her children, her daughters. Um, Marta came from Cuba. And I'm going to read you a little bit about life in Cuba before she uh, came to America. I was nine when Castro took over Cuba. Batista had previously been the dictator in control of Cuba. But when Castro came into power, he promised us all that he would restore power to the people and look out for us. In 1959, he assumed power, and it was just the opposite of what he had said, because things got much worse. He didn't tell us that he was a communist and that he said everything was going to be better. Well, after he took over the other provinces in the country, he came into Havana with his armed forces. And I would see planes flying over our house with big guns. We had wooden blinds on our windows that looked out onto the street and a balcony off of our room. I would stand there looking through those wooden doors and my mom would be yelling at me to get away from there because there were shootings. It got so bad that we were afraid to go outside because there were bombs going off on the streets and in the theater. There were protests against Castro, but those who protested were arrested and you would not see them again. Castro had what he called paradon, which refers to a firing squad. And that's what they would do to people and how the law was enforced if you did something against the government. Once Castro took over, he got rid of all the history books at my school and started teaching from the time of the revolution on. We wore uniforms at school and were constantly made to march to the main plaza to listen to his speeches. There was one of the that was one of the big reasons my mom wanted to get me out of there. They were teaching kids propaganda about the US and my mom knew it was all lies. In the house we lived in, my mom had some friends upstairs where she would go to listen to Radio Free Europe, which told we were told was evil, of course. That was how she was able to keep track of what was going on. Castro aligned himself with Russia and made a strong showing there. He pretty much sold Cuba to the Russians. Cuba had very, very good soil for produce, sugar cane, coffee, and tobacco. Everything was first class and worth a lot of money. But Castro began shipping all of these things to Russia, and we only got the leftovers or really nasty canned food from Russia. I remember my mom opening a can once and throwing it out because it was so nasty. To get food was a constant struggle. My grandmother would go to where the food was distributed the night before and sit in a chair all night in a long line of people who are waiting for whatever was coming in. That was before they started rationing food, which was based on how many people you had living in your household. And that was when there was food to begin with. So the only way to survive was if you knew people in the United States who would send you money and then you would buy food on the black market. So that's a little piece about Marta's history. Um, her children had never heard any of these stories and they were very grateful that I was able to get her to tell me these stories so that they could hear them too. I'm gonna tell you about um, Pedro. Pedro uh, Azorieta is a man who came over from um, the Basque country of Spain, which is in the north, northwestern coast of Spain. And this part of his memoir is called Coming to America. I was 28 years old when I left Basque country in July 1969 to come to America. I was looking forward to my future and to the opportunities that lay ahead. I was met at the airport in Phoenix by my boss, Don Jose Mantarola. He drove me to his farm in Casa Grande, Arizona, about 48 miles south of Phoenix. The Mantarola sheep farm was a large estate with about 20,000 Merino sheep. My job was to separate them into groups of 1,000 or 2,000 so they could be taken up into the mountains by the shepherds until the cold weather came. At that time, the shepherds would bring the sheep back down to the alfalfa fields. My job was in assisting the shepherd who I worked with by taking care of the food and setting up camp. We typically traveled five miles or more each day in the mountains to provide the sheep with good grazing. 
While the shepherd provided for the 2,000 sheep in our care, I moved the camp from one place to another. That was my responsibility because I was the newest person on the job. The shepherds all had many more years on the job and knew what they needed for the sheep. Part of my job description was to load everything on our six burrows, which would move all of our possessions to a new pasture. I rode on a horse and basically loaded up the burrows. They knew where they were going, where to go and when to stop. When they got to the next place, the burrows already knew they were there. In fact, they knew more than I did. For our meals, the shepherds would slaughter a lamb to eat, and my job was to pre prepare the meat and get rid of the intestines, which smelled really bad. When we ate, we would cut off some of the meat from the carcass and then hang whatever was left in a tree with a sack around it. This was to protect it from flies and also to prevent wild animals from getting at it. However, there were constantly flies anyway. The smell alone was terrible and it made the dogs crazy. They would fight with one another all night long over the odor of the meat and their fighting would keep me awake all night. It was also dangerous for the burrows as the dogs would be fighting. So we would have to move the burrows to a separate area at night so they would be safe. Um, that's a little bit about Pedro's life. And I'm gonna just read you a little bit more and that's gonna be from Dorothy. Uh, Dorothy's family hired me. She was um, in an assisted living facility here in Los Angeles, and she was at the beginning stages of dementia. And they knew that Dorothy had lived in a Japanese internment camp when she was a child. And here's Dorothy. But Dorothy refused to tell her children what it was like during those years. So it was my job to find out from Dorothy what her life was like. So I'm gonna tell you a little about the internment camp. The letter that Dorothy remembers hearing about ordered the family to be ready for transport in a few days or a week to a new location. That place was the Santa Anita racetrack in Pasadena, where she and her family were to be confined in temporary shelters in horse stalls, while the government constructed 10 hastily built internment camps around the country. When the war started, says Dorothy, everyone that was Japanese was forced to leave their homes. It was President Roosevelt's edict. We all had to be moved from the West Coast because we might be in cahoots with the Japanese. We were taken on the trucks that were used for hauling produce, the Santa Anita racetrack, where we stayed for about three months while they counted us and recorded our names. I was eight years old at the time. We weren't there very long. It was a collection place. We were put into stables with asphalt floors, housed in stalls at the racetrack. Dorothy remembers seeing horse hairs on the ceiling of the stalls and making a game of it with her sisters to see who could jump up and touch the horse hairs on the low ceiling. About three months later, Mr. Okobo was told that he and his family were being sent to an internment camp in Rower, Arkansas. Wikipedia describes this place as, as an unincorporated community in Desha County, Arkansas. The community is located on Arkansas Highway 1, and it was a Japanese internment camp designed during World War II. The camp opened in March 1942. It's now the site of the Row War, War Relocation Center. The family were transported by train from Santa Anita Racetrack to Row War for the three-day trip. We were told to pull down the shades and keep them down because officials thought we might send some sort of message to the enemy, says Dorothy. In the beginning, there was a guard who watched over us. We would play a game to see where the guards were so we could peep out the window and see the scenery. At the internment camp, the Okobo family, which numbered six, was given two small rooms to live in to make their home. Dorothy's mother, Fumiko, was pregnant with her sister Sue at the time and gave birth at the camp. Just built, the barracks had tar paper insulation and were arranged in a pattern that Dorothy says resembled the blueprint print of an army barracks. There were 12 barracks per block, 12 blocks in all, with an administration building and a school. They had a latrine and a washroom in the center and a mess hall on the side of the main building. Each barracks had six rooms. We had two because we had so many people in our family. 
Um, Dorothy goes on to tell me how uh, she, as a child, would um, play with other kids at the internment camp. And when I asked her if it was traumatic for her, she said, not really. I had a good time there because for the first time in my life, I didn't have to work after school. Turns out that Dorothy's father made the children work from the time they were old enough to walk. They had to work out in the fields of the orchard that the family were laborers in. And Dorothy remembers as soon as she was able to walk, her father made her pull weeds all day until the sun went down. So when she got to the internment camp, she got to be a child and play and go to school. And for her, that was a break from the drudgery of life before the internment camp. And it was really interesting to me and also to her children that this was her perspective because in her previous telling of the story of the internment camp to her children, she would say, I cannot tell you anything about it. It's too traumatic. And that's why she refused to talk about it. So the story when it comes out might be totally different from what you thought it was if you take the time to listen to your senior stories. So I'm gonna tell you a little about the process of how I write a memoir. Most of the time when people begin this process, they don't know what they're gonna discover because the memories just spring forth as if from out of nowhere. So often you discover new things, memories that were previously hidden. So we start with talking about life as you remember it. And then we start talking about other memories. Like I told you about Dorothy saying that the internment camp was a fun place for her and how she and her friends would sneak under the barbed wire fence and walk to a candy store in the next town and buy penny candy. And I said to her, Dorothy, weren't you afraid of being punished by the guards? She said, no one knew we were gone. We just would come back under the same barbed wire fence. No one even knew we were gone. And she would laugh about it. Uh, so to her as a child, that was part of that internment camp experience. Um, with Marta, her daughters really wanted to hear about their family heritage going back to Cuba. Marta would never tell them about it because it was troubling for her. Um, she was estranged from her mother. What happened was Dor um, Marta's mother uh, was able to send oh. Marta to the United States. Um, right and so when she, can... I'm sorry about that. Uh, she was able to send her daughter, daughter Marta to the United States just as the war was, uh, as Cuba was being taken over by Castro. And because she was able to get her child on a plane, um, Marta was greeted by Catholic charities once she arrived in Miami. And she was put in a uh, foster home where she was raised for the next five years. Marta expected her mother to follow her two weeks later. And that was Marta's mother's intent. But Castro shut down the country shortly after Mar Marta got on the plane and her mother didn't make it out. So for the next five years, Marta was alone with a foster family that she didn't know. And she, she didn't even speak English when she came to America, all she spoke was Spanish. So it was traumatic for her, which is why she didn't wanna tell her daughters about it. Um, however, when she told me about it, she remembered with fondness the family that adopted her, her foster family, and how wonderful it was to be raised in America where she finally had fresh food. She had sisters and brothers in the foster family. She had been an only child back in Cuba. So she now had half sisters and half brothers who she enjoyed spending time with. So a whole different set of memories came forward from speaking to her about her past. Um, I'm going to fast forward and tell you more about some things that came out of the memoirs. Dorothy's family got to hear about her life, and they started feeling compassion for her. Same with Marta's children. Um, Marta had a difficult life. Um, after she 
came to America and met her husband to be uh, and got married as a young woman, she had five children, all daughters, but the marriage didn't work out. Her husband turned out to be an alcoholic and didn't really spend time with her and Marta didn't drink. So they had two separate lives. Marta finally divorced him. And since he had all the money and she had none, uh, she couldn't hire an attorney to represent her who you know, took care of her needs. So her husband asked for total custody of her, her five daughters and Marta lost custody. And as a result, she felt a tremendous sense of guilt. And her daughters had been angry at her for not, you know, being able to raise them. So once they heard her story from her perspective about her marriage, they too were able to find compassion in their hearts for their mother, who they now spend a lot of time with as adults. I'm going to tell you a little bit more um, about one person who I didn't mention before, and that was Kim. Um, Kim was 21 years old and a young woman living in Cambodia when her family, who were middle class citizens in Cambodia, uh, were forced to march into the jungle because the Khmer Rouge uh, army forces had a gun to their back. They and everyone else in Cambodia were forced out into the jungles. Many, many thousands of people were uh, killed on the spot. And Kim told me the stories. It was hair raising. Um, she told me one of the things she said was that anyone who wore glasses was immediately killed by the Khmer Rouge soldiers because they were considered intellectuals and they probably wore glasses because they read books. And if you read books, you were not going to be a good candidate for them to brainwash you to be a communist. So they were just immediately killed. Anyone who wore glasses was killed. So what a lot of people who wore glasses would do is they would take their glasses off when they were rounded up but the soldiers had a way of finding out. They would force them to um, focus on something you know, far in the distance. And if that individual couldn't tell them what they were asked to identify, they would know that they wore glasses and they would kill them. And Kim told me all these stories. She also told me that she spent four years just surviving in the jungles in Cambodia with a handful of rice was all they were fed by the soldiers, a handful of rice per day, per person. It wasn't even per meal, it was per day. Um, she and her father, mother and brothers and one sister would have to hunt uh, for edible food from plants in the jungle, um, they didn't really know what was edible. They would watch the monkeys and see what the monkeys ate. If the monkeys ate it, then they knew it was edible and they could eat it. And this is how they survived. Um, they were frightened because there were noises in the jungle. It was dark. Uh, they had never lived in the jungle before. They were middle-class people, shop owners, but they did what they had to to survive. And all but one sister survived, um, unfortunately that sister was murdered. And Kim told me that up until the time she told me the stories about her life, she had uh, nightmares every night for 40 years because she would wake up in the middle of the night and think she was still in the jungle and she would be frightened that she was gonna be killed. But she told me that in the telling of the stories to me, it lessened her burden. She no longer had to carry these stories with her. She no longer felt obligated to hold on to those stories for the people who, who died. So that's one of the benefits you I often see is once people tell me the stories, it lessens their burdens. I wanna tell you a little about how I got started and writing memoirs for my own family. So this is my grandmother I'm introducing you to. Uh, she was 16 years old in that photo and she was standing on a beach 
in Boston with her little hat. I love that hat. Uh, that's how they dress. They wore bloomers, you know, with the leggings underneath um, and little hats because it was fashionable to go to the beach. But you, you know, you didn't really want to go in the water. Uh, that was, you know, perhaps not a good thing to do. So my grandmother and I were very close. Uh, I was fortunate to get to know my grandmother. She was with me till I was 33 years old. Um, and I knew that she came from the Ukraine. I knew the name of her village. It was Shepatovka because she would talk about it. I knew her brothers, I knew her sisters. She came from a large family and we were well acquainted because that was my family. We were a close family. Um, however, I didn't know about my mother's side of the family. My mother uh, had uh, a father who had predeceased. deceased um, the rest of the family. Her father passed away when my mom was 11. And so I never met him. I was told he came from Austria. I did know my grandmother. She died when I was 16 and she came from Germany, but she never spoke about the past. And if I asked any questions, she told me not to ask her. She did not like talking about it. So I knew very little about my maternal grandparents. So that was where I began exploring my family and I signed up for Ancestry.com. And once I was there, I started finding things like this manifest of a ship that my grandfather traveled over to America on. And I began to see that I was related to other people who had also come over around that point in time and had listed similar names, last names, and also from the same village. And I was able to connect with some of those people's descendants. This was my grandmother on the left, my maternal grandmother and my maternal grandfather who died when my mom was young. Uh, I didn't know anything much about my grandfather, but I began to learn about him as I did more research. And these were my grandparents. These were my grandmother's parents. Um, and you can see from the photo, this was Victorian age, early 1900s. The women wore their hair piled up on their head and they wore lace kind of dresses. And the men always were photographed with a very stern expression on their face. So I got to know my family by doing research and I began contacting other family members who I was able to find through um, you know, uh, different resources, some family members I had access to already, and some I was able to find by going online and finding them through Facebook, LinkedIn. I had a, a researcher help me find some people, and some of the people I was able to call, others email, some of them were willing to talk to me, some of them weren't. But I asked each person I was able to reach to tell me their stories of the elders in the family. And from their stories, I was able to piece together four family memoirs, my all four grandparents' branches. And I was able to go back to my great grandparents on each branch, and then all, all the way down to the current uh, generation, which I'm a part of, and also the children of my generation. So um, it was very worthwhile of an experience for me to do this. Um, and from doing that, I realized that if it brought me value, maybe it would be helpful if I could do this for other people. And that is why I do the memoirs today. I believe everybody has value to their stories. I think everyone has a life that is worth telling stories from, worth preserving. I know for a fact that the stories that I was able to put together brought value to other people in my family. It connected us all. It gave us a reason to want to talk to one another again. It gave us a reason to bond with our common ancestors. And um, I think everyone enjoyed seeing my memoirs. I wrote them, I sent them to all the family members who I had spoken with. Um, people of all walks of life do write memoirs and it makes them feel good about themselves. 
because now they know they're not going to be forgotten um, by future generations who maybe won't be there when they pass on. Um, and it's a way of contributing to their families, their heritage, um, their values, and creating some sort of legacy for the family members to remember them by. So um, sometimes people write their history um, because they want someone to know something that they haven't talked about. Like in the case of Marta, Kim, and uh, Pedro, uh, and Dorothy, uh, sometimes it's because no one has, it, has given them an opportunity to listen to their stories. Um, so if you're, if you have seniors in your family, or if you are a senior, I would say it's never too late to get started on your memoir. You definitely want to do it before you have problems with your health, um, because it does require a little stamina to tell your stories. How long should your memoir be? I've had them be as short for my clients as 25 or 30 pages. I am working on one now that's over 400 pages. Uh, that particular one is a woman who was the record keeper for her family. She has everyone in the family's uh, records that go back on all four branches of her grandparents, pre-Civil War, all the way back to the Revolutionary War. She actually has four patriots in the family that were Revolutionary War fighters. And uh, she feels the need to record these stories now because she might not have anyone to take these records and carry on with the family history. And she doesn't want it to end with her. It's very important to her that people who come after her uh, don't forget the rest of the family. Um, you can judge how long you want it to be. Like I said, sometimes people have just enough to say that it makes up 30 pages, and that's enough for them. Sometimes people have tried to write it themselves and they just need help finishing it. Um, I've done work with people in, in that capacity. I have also worked with people who just want to tell me from scratch. They've never written anything down. I'm working on a book now with someone who's doing that. And I'm also working with someone uh, named Edward, who um, his family came from Seattle. Uh, he was born in Seattle. He was raised in the Seattle area. And uh, he's a Korean War veteran. So he wants his children to know about the, the um, past. Um, so you can include in your memoir any photos, documents, uh, marriage certificates, um, the woman whose uh, memoir is over 400 pages, that's Nancy B. Her name is actually Nancy B. Um, very interesting name. She is including photographs of all the antiques that she has inherited through the years. We have four or five antiques to a page and we have over a hundred pages. So you can imagine how many antiques this woman has now. Um, the memoir can be a digital memoir. It can be a printed memoir. It does not have to be a book and it can be very cost effective. So where do you begin? You start with an outline. What are the chapters going to be in your life? What are the main events in your life? Just for starters, write those down. Give some thought to that. Once you do that, you can start filling them in with as much detail as you want. And then you can go back to them after you've done the first draft and add more detail, add additional memories that you think of, maybe correct names that maybe you wrote down in the first draft that aren't accurate, or dates that you didn't know previously and you found out from looking at some records what those dates should be. Don't leave anything out that you can remember write it all down. It can always be edited out in a final version if you so choose. Who should you do this for? Do it for yourself. But do it with the perspective of who's going to read it. 
So if this is for your children or grandchildren, you might wanna make it G-rated, right? You don't want them reading really private memories. I've told you a little about the format. Um, what's the value it has to other people? Here are some things. You get to review significant events in your life and make sense of them as you think about them from your perspective today. You get to create a record of who you are for others to remember you by or get to know you right now. You get to re-experience and remember people you've loved over the years, early childhood memories that you may have forgotten previously. They will start coming back once you start doing this. It's amazing how they spring up out of nowhere. You get to tell the story in your own way, however you want to tell it. And it is often very therapeutic, writing about painful memories, because you get to see see it through that process of maybe thinking of it from an adult perspective and looking at it differently than you looked at it as a child. Sharing your story can strengthen and often does strengthen bonds with family members. Um, it has a higher purpose and that is to allow others to know us after we're gone. Wouldn't it be nice if you got to design how people remember you? And that's what your memoirs are for, to create an account of how you will be remembered. I believe everybody has a story within them or many stories that are just waiting for somebody to write them down. And it's up to you, obviously, if you're going to want to do that, um, whether you want to share experiences you've had in life. If you feel that it would be embarrassing now, you can always wait and ask that it be part of your estate plan and not be shared until after you are gone. You can always do it that way. But I believe our elders are our greatest links to the past of times gone by and of people who are no longer with us. And once these memories are gone, once those people who have the stories are gone, sometimes it's too late. If you should want help, this is how I help people. This is how I give back. I've been a writer my whole life. I was a news journalist. I was a radio news broadcaster. I am a memoir writer, as well as a book writer, uh, as well as a business content writer. But my favorite part of what I do is writing memoirs for seniors. That's really my favorite part. I read historical bios. That's all I read, historical bios. I read a book every three weeks. I do this because I love history and I love reading from the person's perspective who was the author, or in some cases, um, the novelist who writes historical uh, biographies. And I read a lot of them. So you are always welcome to go to my website, which is writer patkramer.com and that's right there on the screen or email me at pat at writer patkramer.com you're welcome to call me I don't always have the opportunity to speak at the time people call me because I'm either in a presentation or I'm writing so if I'm writing I won't pick up the phone it'll go to voicemail but you're welcome to leave me a message um, so I would like to thank you to, and encourage you to just be a part of the process of creating your own legacy. Be the person who tells your own story. And like I said, we all have stories to tell. It is never too late to get started. And with that, that I'd like a, to yeah, open that was it up. A great presentation. And if anybody has any questions for Pat while we have her here for another 10 minutes or so, put them in the Q&A box. But I do have some questions for you, Pat. Are you ready? I am ready. Um, how many interviews on average does it normally take to get through sort of the memoir writing process, like if they're working with somebody? Sure. Uh, the short ones, it would be four hours of interview for roughly a 25 to 30 page memoir. 
And so for every four hours, I need about five to six more hours of writing time to transcribe each interview and to write it. So basically four hours is the short one. Most of them would average 10 hours. Um, the lady who I'm working with that has the 400 pager, I think we've done 50 hours. So I would say average 10 hours, somewhere between five and 10 hours average, but um, it can go 20 hours too. It's whatever the person's budget is and whatever they feel comfortable with. The time they're, they're putting in. Do you give people homework? Like you've met with them, you give them something to start, you know, cause I think that's the hardest part is starting, right? Like I need a prompt, I need something to think about because it can be overwhelming if you're 80 years old and say like, I'm gonna just start writing my memoir. So do you kind of give them something to think about? Yes. Um... I like to describe it as my relationship with the person who I'm interviewing is I am their friend. I am their confidant. I ask them to look at me as a friend and someone they're just telling stories to. And I always tell them at the end of the hour interview, you're going to be remembering additional memories from what we just talked about. Keep a pen and a pad of paper next to your bed because as soon as you remember that name of your childhood friend or that teacher, that write it down. Moment. Right, it's that aha moment. Write it down because these things are going to come to you when you're least expect it. Like for me, I find when I'm calm and peaceful, it might be when I'm just about to fall asleep or it may be when I'm taking a walk with my dogs. That's when the memories will come to me. That makes sense. Um Everyone else, you can ask questions too. I mean, I have more questions. Um, what, what, it sounds kind of like therapy, right? So it, it, can it be sort of a difficult process to go through? Like you said, some of these memories are, you might not want everyone to read them, you know, while you're still living. This is a big red bow they're going to get after they right. pass away. Do you well, find that people value it more than finding it difficult? It definitely is going to, um, cause emotions to come alive because whenever you talk about the past whether it's your grandparents who passed away or a dog who passed away you're going to think about that dog and start crying right because you love that dog of course yeah so when you re-experience memories it's going to cause some emotions to come to the surface but that's therapeutic as anyone who ever has experienced any kind of psychotherapy knows you have to cry to get these things out. And if you have never spoken about those memories, like Kim from Cambodia, never talked about any of this because she was fearful. She was afraid to talk about it. She lives in what's considered little Cambodia in the Southern part of Los Angeles. And she has been afraid for 40 years of talking about these memories because apparently when the Red Cross um, helped the refugees come to America after, um, after Khmer Rouge took over and, and Cambodia fell and some of the refugees got able, you know, taken to refugee camps and helped, some of the Khmer Rouge also came into the came uh, refugee too, right? camps right. and they posed as refugees as well. And they are also living in those communities of little Vietnam and little Cambodia. So she's fearful that someone who was a Cambodian Khmer Rouge soldier might be living on the next block. And if they know that she wrote this memoir, they might want to hunt her down and put an end to her. That's intense. What is really interesting now, and, and that's a fear from a PTSD victim. That's very, very common. What is true is no one's going to read it but her family because it's not going to be published. No one's ever going to know about this stuff because it's never going to be published. And her last name is not included on the memoir I shared with you. So you're not going to know who she is. True. And if there even were Khmer Rouge soldiers that came over that was 40 years ago, do you think they're going to ruin their lives and do something that causes them to be 
extradited, sort of right? Yeah. yeah. Extradited back to Cambodia. I doubt it because they're not, they're not teenagers anymore. A lot of the Cambodia, uh, the Khmer Rouge soldiers were child soldiers. They were between the ages of 16 and 21. It was scary. That, that does sound scary, but good points. So that's something to think about. Um, but like I said, she no longer has nightmares and that she told she's me able to get it out. Uh, right? Once she was able to release the memories, she didn't feel she had to carry them anymore in her mind. And it was a great burden for her to carry them all those years. I got goosebumps. She had survivor's Dang guilt. It. Yeah, I have totally had goosebumps when you said that. Mm -hmm. um, what is your favorite part of helping someone create their memoirs? Listening to them, talking with the seniors, hearing their perspective, kidding around with them. I try to make jokes and, you know, make light as much as possible. I, I always bring compassion to the process. Um, one of the people who I interviewed cried a lot and that was just her personality. And, you know, I just, I, I cried with her, you know, and I bring compassion to the process because they've never done this before and they need somebody who cares about those memories. And I'm the self-elected person to do that. You're a good person, as you all can tell. Okay, so I have my last question for you before we go today is, what is the most valuable piece of advice that you have to give to people who are thinking about starting their, the process of writing their memories or their memoirs or anything like that? Start it somewhere. Don't try to micromanage yourself. It's a process. You're not gonna get it right in the first draft. You're not gonna remember everything you wanna remember in the first draft. It is a process like anything. Learning to play guitar is a process. Learning to read, learning a foreign language. Everything is going to take time and it's going to require edits. Don't go into it being hard on yourself. Just get started somewhere and start now because you don't know what tomorrow brings. You don't know whether you're gonna have a tomorrow. Every time I got on a plane to go somewhere, I start thinking about that. And maybe I'm overreacting because I've been flying on planes since I was 12 years old, uh, but I still think that way. So I would say, don't, don't wait too long to get the process started. Start it somewhere and start it soon. So at least there's something that your, your children can remember you by, and you can always add to it, but get started. It's, it's a part of your estate plan, That's having true. that legacy. In, we have a legacy section in our estate plan. So Pat is right. We have it there for you to just start it, you know? And you as an estate planning professional know, you know, from the people you interview, you know, they have interesting lives in addition to their monetary fortune they have all these valuable memories and that's just as valuable as anything you know physical that they or material that they own absolutely and it needs to be protected well pat we're running out of time i wanted to say a special thank you for joining us today with our friday ask the expert uh when we're done today we'll be sending an email out to everyone with pat's contact information so if it's time like you're ready to pull off the band-aid and start writing your memoir, you'll be able to reach out to Pat for helpful tips. And then also to let everyone know that uh, to join us for our ne next Ask the, Ask the Expert, which will be Friday, July 22nd at noon as well. And we're going to have Tammy Anastasia join us, who's going to talk about uh, dementia and communication with a dementia person, which will be very helpful. I know Tammy personally too. She helped us with my grandparents. Uh, so again, Pat, thank you for joining us and I hope everyone thank has a really you, great Maggie. weekend. Thank you, Maggie. You, thank you so much for the opportunity to share my You're stories. You're welcome. Absolutely. Bye, everyone. Nice meeting you all. Bye.